All right, we'll record this for Tyler. Y'all ready to get started? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the end of a busy week and the beginning of a new week. And we pray that all you've done over the last few days, you would continue to do as we move into the future. We know you're with us, and we thank you for that, and ask that you bless our time of study together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, uh, we're in Romans chapter 2. We left off halfway through this verse. Somebody needs to keep a, a watch on the, on the time so I don't go over, okay. since I'm using my phone to record this. Uh, if you recall, Romans chapter 2, Paul is talking about where we left off a couple weeks ago, that everybody knows the truth of God and has the law of God written in their heart. Therefore, everyone is accountable. He's going to expand on that now. Everyone is accountable to what they know. And, and, and his point is that everybody knows what is right and what is wrong. Therefore, everyone is going to stand guilty before God. <laughs> you know, uh, there's no excuse. No one can jump up and say, I didn't know, uh, because you instinctively know it's wrong to murder. Did that one break? Yeah. Wow. Junk chairs. Oh, That's why I use the white Whoever donated these chairs. Yeah, they should. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if, if we back up uh, to the other verse, to those who by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life, kind of like the positive side, and then he, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. So what's going to come up with them from God? It's going to be wrath because of where their hearts are set, what their desire in life is. Uh, and so we, we left off in this verse, those who live with no faith receive what sin deserves. You know, we would justly all stand guilty before God except for faith. Remember, eternity is determined not because you're a sinner, but on the basis of faith. You go to heaven or hell, whether or not you have faith, if you are forgiven through faith, you have eternal life. If you have no faith, you go to hell because you had no faith in Jesus as your Savior, but then you are punished for the sin you committed. Your sins don't send you to hell. Your lack of faith sends you to hell. So the opposite of righteousness is unrighteousness. Those who sow to the flesh will reap judgment. And we have several passages we started looking at last time. The anger and wrath of God will be set against them. So... From chapter 1, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And we, we looked at these passages last time. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give grief to you, give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Now that's a pretty frightening image. Christ is going to come back and we're going to be delivered from the suffering we're going through. And the guys that are doing the suffering, you know, the affliction on us are going to get exactly what they deserve. I mean, that's a, you know, he's coming back with fire and his angels are with him and he's going to give to them what they deserve. This is... You know, Which is the, the devil. Well, the devil and, and, and other people who have rejected the truth, who are persecuting which are, Christians. Which are of the devil. Yes. Or, or because they're, they're, they're the others. Right. The other side. And, that, and that, you know, those who do not obey the gospel, those who've rejected Jesus, who are not believers, are going to get what they deserve for what they're doing. Okay? And that's harsh words. That's actually where we left off. The indignation of God against sin and sinners. But it's not just the devil, of course. The, 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 right. It's also, that's Jews. Anyone who has rejected, anyone who's rejected Jesus. Jesus. And see, that's the thing. Jesus came the first time as Savior. The world exists right now under a period of, of grace. He's given everyone the opportunity to know him as Savior. The Spirit's in the world, working through God's people to communicate the gospel to the unbelievers in this world so they can know Jesus as Savior. When he comes back again, he's not coming as Savior. He's coming as Judge. And the opportunity and the time for repenting and believing him is over when he comes back. There are no second chances. What if they never knew that there was a God or Jesus? 
Well, that's where he talks about in the earlier in chapter in this chapter that you're still guilty because you have not lived up to what you know is right. Everyone knows that it's, a matter, it's an issue of sin. Everyone knows to murder is wrong. Now you may pervert it. You may say, we're not gonna murder our tribesmen, but we're gonna murder people in that tribe. So you justify your actions. Everyone is guilty and they know they're guilty. Uh, and they have not restrained or, or stepped away from what they know is wrong. Well, I'm, you know, again, I'm not going to I'm not going to say that God doesn't have a way. We've had stories coming out of out of Iran and Iraq and places where Jesus has appeared to people to lead them to faith uh, and to find fellowship with other believers because the gospel is prohibited. You can't preach, and so I'm never going to say God won't find a way. But what we know is that we're given the responsibility to preach the gospel. Where those who have rejected it, they stand in judgment. Uh, and they can't say, well, I didn't know. They can't say, I well, wasn't that bad. You've because been exposed to it or understood, you know, that that's there. But right. to turn your back on it, that's different than if you never knew it. You know? Well, I mean. So I've always wondered about that. But, but, but see, we can't, we, can't, we can't say with certainty. Because even in the Old Testament, when God was you know, wiping out entire nations to, to preserve the promise. Uh, those people had no knowledge of God, you know, and this is the thing is we want to play God off as the bad guy if he didn't do what we want him to do. But the reality is we all deserve hell and God is just in giving everyone exactly what they deserve if you send all of us to hell. And he's the good guy in doing that because he's doing what is right. The fact that he intervenes and saves us is grace. And so if someone is raised in an Islamic country and believes in Allah and follows Muhammad and never hears about Jesus and dies, they're going to hell, even though they didn't hear, because in their heart of hearts, they still stand guilty of sin. They knew they were doing wrong. So, I mean, it's, it's a hard reality that we're in this world for a purpose, and that is to make Jesus known because people are going to perish without him. If, if, if he just let everyone go to heaven who never heard of him, It'd be better if we kept our mouth shut and never told anyone. Then they could go to heaven. That's not how it works. It's got to be a line in the sand somewhere. Yeah. You know, you have, you have so here's several passages. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with such patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Now notice, here he's talking about we deserve destruction, but look what he's doing. He's enduring with patience. He's giving us time. He's giving us the opportunity. We deserve wrath, but he hasn't given it to us yet. Okay? Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? Uh, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. So we're talking about just his indignation. But a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Um, and this is that Hebrews passage we go to often, 1026, the verse before this says, if we go on willfully sinning after having received the knowledge of the truth, then no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a terrifying expectation of judgment. So if you know who Jesus is and you turn your back on him, you know who Jesus is, you know what's right, and you just choose to do what's wrong, this is what you expect. This is what you're getting. So the idea of once saved, always saved. That, oh yeah, I know Jesus is my Savior and I'm going to go frolic. Yeah. No, it doesn't work that way. Okay. He also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now there he's talking about the devil. Remember, all those who side with the devil end up getting what he gets. Now, there, now see, there's, there's images in here we would go to with Jesus, too. Before the cross, Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. What is it? The full strength of the cup of his anger. You know, uh, that's what Jesus endured on the cross. So we wouldn't have to. But if you don't have Jesus... And the fact that he endured it for you, 
you get it. The same thing. So you're going to get the same thing Jesus got on the cross if you don't believe in him. Wrath and fury of God. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. Babylon is the image of the unbelieving world. What? You got a thought? No, I was just trying to get that in my head. The, the cup earlier. Jesus. Babylon got that cup to pour out on. No, no. Babylon is the image of the unbelieving world. In Revelation, Babylon is the, is the harlot, the one who rejected, who stands opposed to God, the devil. And, and so Jesus took the full cup of the wine of God's wrath at the cross so we wouldn't have to. But if you reject what Jesus did, you get the same judgment that he took on the cross for you. You rejected what he did for you, so you get it for yourself. So the whole world is going to suffer the judgment of God upon sin that Jesus already endured on the cross. That's his point. No one has to go to hell. God's made a way of salvation for everyone. You know, Jesus already endured it for us. So you're, you're a sinner, you give your life to Christ, you continue sinning. And in that continued sinning, you die, this is what you get. Well, no, no, notice, we're always going to be sinful. Right. We're never going to reach holiness and perfection this side of, of eternity. Right. But if you are made aware that you have a sin in your life, what are you supposed to do? Ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness and repent. repent, which means Not do it again. stop doing what you're doing. Right. Go the other way. Repent means do a 180. Start doing the other, th the opposite. Okay? So, and, and will you do that perfectly? Probably not, because temptation is real, and you'll probably give in again. Okay? That, and, and when you sin, you're, what, is, what, is, what happens? You're remorseful. You're sorry you sin. You go to Jesus. You ask for forgiveness. That's a whole lot different than you saying, that girl that came to my apartment and offered me what she offered me, I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway because I want to. And God, you're, you're gracious. God, you're going to forgive me anyway, aren't you? I'll just go do it. Nope. What's the nope. attitude? That ain't going to happen. You're thumbing your nose at Jesus and the cross. Yeah. And there is no forgiveness for that until you truly come to a point of repentance. Yeah. No, that ain't, that ain't See, the right. attitude of I'm going to do what I want to do because I don't care what God thinks or the other, this cheap grace idea, well, God's a grace guy. He's going to forgive me anyway, so I'm going to do it because he's going to forgive everything anyway. Either one of those attitudes nullifies the forgiveness Jesus offers because Jesus offers forgiveness where there is faith and repentance. And repentance is you're sorry for your sin and you desire to do it no more. And you know, I, I, if I remember correctly, I told her that don't be a tentor. Don't, yeah. don't do Bobby that. had a girl come to his apartment. I need some money. Will you, will you pay me if I have sex with you? Oh, really? Yeah. I was at the door. He didn't even have to come looking. Well, I just, she, I've been praying with her for a while, and she's been on and on, but okay. now she's... Yeah, going deeper and deeper. Yeah, and it ain't going to happen. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. So there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now remember, Paul's writing to the Romans. He's never been there. This is his letter of introduction. He's saying, you know, this is who I am. This is what I teach. I'm coming your way. Prepare, I'm gonna, prepare for me because I'm coming to visit. Uh, and what's his message? The judgment of God is coming upon sinners. Whether you're Jew or whether you're Greek. Because there would have been Jewish Christians. Remember, the church in Rome was started after people who were in Jerusalem for Pentecost went back to Rome. Pentecost was a traveling feast. Everybody came to Jerusalem. They heard the message. They became Christians. Went back and started the church. Church was started probably by Jews. And yes, eventually had Gentiles in it. Paul's message is, so you're Jew and you think you're going to escape the wrath of God? Uh-uh. Not without Jesus. Okay? Now Ezekiel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. So, it's not like, wow, I've screwed up so much, I'm under the judgment of God, I need a Savior. No. You were born, you're under the judgment of God, you need a Savior. 
everyone is sinful. And there's not like you finally get so bad you're under judgment. No, you're under judgment from the beginning. You need a Savior. And, you know, and what's his point in Ezekiel? Your daddy was sinful. You're sinful. All are sinful. The soul that sin shall die. You're under judgment, period. So this isn't the father and the son. Heaven. This is earthly. Earthly, yeah. Because I'm sitting, I'm trying to figure out who's talking about God say, God's God's saying soul. all souls are mine. Earthly, yeah. earthly father and sons. Yeah. Okay. What will profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I saw a cartoon thing the other day. And and there's three frames. Young man, it's like like the wind's blowing dollar bills. Young man is running. You can see he's young and he's grabbing money. Next frame, middle-aged man is running, grabbing money. Third frame, on the edge of a cliff says the end, old man holding all the money as the end. You're done. What will you give in exchange for your soul? So many people think everything is about life is in this world. See, I was sitting there thinking if the wind's blowing, the money, you are just standing right below the feet. <laughs> it's blowing away from him, though. <laughs> so, so Paul is clear. There are consequences for the person who sins. This is true for both Jew and Gentile. Uh, consequences can be in this life or the life to come. So let's use Bobby's scenario for, since it's real. Bobby's tempted, Bobby gives in. What are the consequences? Well, it could be eternal if he doesn't repent. It could also be very real and very now, very temporal, very immediate. What disease are you gonna catch? What disease you're gonna to have to live with? Because she ain't only doing this with you. She's doing this with anybody who's got any money in her pocket. So what disease, what are the immediate consequences of the choices you make versus the eternal consequences? That's true for every sin. Every sin has consequences, every sin. If she came to me and offered me the same thing, and I said, yeah, I'm gonna give in to that. Well, you have the potential of disease, but also now I've sinned against my wife, and broken that relationship. I've hurt my kids. You know, there's all kinds, I'd lose my position in the church. There's all kinds of just ripple effect of the consequences of a choice. Earthly consequences that come from being tempted and giving in to temptation. And we see in the, in the immediacy of temptation, all we think of is the immediate gratification, the immediate pleasure. We don't think about the consequences. And yet, if we're aware of the consequences, there's enough consequence to say, uh-uh, I don't want that. That's not good for me. And, and, along with the fact I'm sinning against God. Because it should terrify you what could happen when you give in to temptation. And so pick another sin. I'm going to steal. Or well, you're going to lose your job. You're going to, you know, your reputation is going to be shot. You're not going to be able to get another decent job. You know, I'm going to embezzle money. I'm going to jail. What's that going to do to me? I mean, you know, pick any consequence you want. Speeding down the road, I'm going to get a ticket. Which means I'm going to have the money to maybe buy the enough groceries to pay, feed my kids. Everything's got temporal, earthly consequences as well as eternal. So, but the glory, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he's being very fair. You know. Paul makes no, no qualm about salvation is of the Jews, starting with them. You know, uh, God chose Abraham and his descendants to be the vessel through whom he would bring the Savior of the whole world into, in, into being. So salvation came through the Jews. They are honored and privileged to be the ones that God chose to, to use in history. Uh, and, you know, Paul will, will elevate them and celebrate that. But the Jews themselves took it as we're better than everybody else. And, and Paul is trying to help them understand God chose you. That was grace. There was nothing about you. You're the least of all the people. He chose you to use you to be a blessing to everyone. That was the purpose and the role of the Jewish nation. So he's very quick to, to flip it around again. There's, you know, yes, there's judgment, but there's also blessing for those who are faithful. Uh, and God shows no partiality. And that comes up time and time again. All are judged on the basis of faith. 
He was believed and is, and is baptized shall be saved, but he who is disbelieved shall be condemned. Faith means salvation. No faith means damnation. Very, very. And it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Greek. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter whether you're unknown or famous. The world standard is, oh, Bobby's famous. He deserves special recognition. Not from God. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. What in the world does that mean? You are rewarded beyond what you could ever imagine. Because you are a child of God. The unfading crown says unfading. Huh? The unfading crown. See, the, we, we go to heaven because we have faith in Jesus as our Savior. But having faith in Jesus as our Savior, who does that make us? We are children of God. What does the king do for his children? Everything. And he bestows upon them great honor. And that's the passage that everyone cringes at when I say it. What Revelation 3, 28. To the one who overcomes, I will give to sit on my throne. Jesus is talking. I will give to sit on my throne even as I overcame was given to sit on my father's throne. So Jesus overcame and sat on his father's throne. When we overcome, which is to die in the faith, we get to sit on the throne beside Jesus, beside the father. Here's an image of that. You're given a crown. You are a prince or a princess of heaven. You rule. You reign. You share God's glory. Which, can we fathom that? <laughs> Not at all. And yet that's exactly what God says is going to happen to us. Because we have been adopted as his children. And that's what the king does for his children. Okay? Uh, and it, it blows our mind. You know? There's no partiality with God. Do we see partiality when dealing with people? All the time. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes to you, to your assembly, with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my foot, by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil motives? And what do we see going on in the churches all the time? Well, this person's got money. They put a lot of money in the plate. We couldn't make it without them. We're going to make special allowances for them. We're not going to talk to this family about their kids living together before they get married because they'll get mad and they can leave the church. But this family over here, whose kids are doing the same thing, we're going to jump all over them. Okay. It's very natural to our sinful nature to show partiality between people. And we do it based on skin color. We do it based on matter of dress. I mean, it, it's part of our human nature. We want to do that. We have to fight against the desire to do that. The message of Scripture is consistent. In opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. Remember Peter's thing? He would, uh, he would, and Paul actually uh, got on to Peter. He would do everything with the Gentiles when he was with them, but when Jews showed up, he'd separate from the Gentiles and be a Jew again. Uh, you know, and God had to kind of, Jesus had to kind of slap him upside the head and say, you can't do that. But from those who are of high <laughs> reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, there were as those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. Are we reading that right? So, you know, Paul didn't impress the rich and famous. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during your time, the time of your stay upon earth. So, don't think that you've got a special 
ticket with God. You're going to stand equal with everybody else. Any questions down to that passage? For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Again, it's the, the, the Romans, you know, verses 14 and 15, which we're about to get to, where the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law. These show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. So again, the illustration of murder. We know what's wrong with murder. But if I go murder someone, I stand guilty of breaking the law, even though I've never heard the commandment, you shall not murder. So the reality is everyone is guilty of sin, and they know they have done wrong. They know they've done wrong. Why do you think so many false religions exist? Because people want something to do with their guilt. How do I get rid of my guilt? Well, I've got to, there's obviously somebody greater than me that can do with my guilt. So I come up with a system of religion by which I can deal with my guilt and feel satisfied or justified that I'm not going to be punished. So what is that? Well, pick one. The Roman gods, the Greek gods, they had their way that you were going to be saved. Uh, Hinduism has its way. Buddhism has its way. You know, all these different religions have their way by which you are eventually going to be saved if you're good enough. It's always based on if you're good enough. It's always work salvation. That's what sets Christianity apart. You can't be good enough, so God did it for you. But there's always, every religion has its method of salvation for those who believe and follow their rules. So people who, don't have the, who do not have the law of God, the Ten Commandments, will still be found guilty of breaking the law of God written upon their hearts. So no one can stand up and say, I didn't do anything wrong. Everyone knows. Those who have the law of God clearly revealed will be judged according to this revelation. So for those who know the Ten Commandments, that's the law. Where everything else in the Old Testament, all the laws, the moral laws, are just an expounding of those ten. There's ten, ten laws, and they're expounded over and over again in different applications. You know what they are. You break them, you're guilty. It's that simple. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Can you, and that's it's where Paul's going to go, if you could keep the Ten Commandments perfectly, if you keep the law of God perfectly, would you be saved on the basis of the law? If you could keep it perfectly, then you're holy. Is that possible? No, it's not. You would have to be holy starting out, yeah. like Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, to be able to keep the law perfectly with a pure heart. Because remember what Jesus said, you know, if you're angry with your brother, then you've committed murder. If you've lusted, you've committed adultery. If you've coveted, you've stolen. Okay? Because you've committed the sin in your heart, even though you haven't done it with the actions of your hands. So Jesus shows us that this that sin is not just our actions, but even it's down deeper. The only way that a person could keep the law is to be born holy, as Jesus was, so it could keep the law perfectly, which he did for us, because that's what happens on the cross. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so we through him might become the righteousness of God. The theologians call it the great exchange. He takes our sin upon himself, and takes his holiness, his righteousness, and gives it to us. So we tra trade places when he's on the cross. So that the sinner dies under the judgment of God. And the unrighteous person is declared to be holy and righteous before God because of what happened at the cross. So God looks at you today as one who has faith. And what does he see? This is very important. What does God see when he looks at you right now? <clears throat> He sees you as perfect and holy and righteous and acceptable before him in every way. It's only because he's looking at us through Jesus. Yes. 
Yes. And so on, we got to hang up a marker board. Huh? Yeah, anymore. Because what it is, is, is you remember the song, who, who did the song, Rose Colored Glasses years ago? That song? Oh, yeah. Okay. That, that's my image. God's looking at us through rose colored glasses. He's looking at us through the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is filtering everything so that, so that we appear before God as holy because through faith, the blood of Christ is covering us. This side of heaven, as I look at myself in the mirror, I still, know, I still know I'm a sinner. So I still need to hold on to Jesus in faith. I still need to understand temptation and repentance and what it means to struggle against sin and live the Christian life. That's me, this side of heaven. So you've got the now and not yet, who I am now and who I will be. Okay, and so how do we term that in, in theology? The, the old Latin, simulustus et peccator. I'm at the same time a saint and a sinner. From God's perspective, I'm a saint, forgiven by the blood of Jesus, made holy, but I'm also at the same time a sinner because I'm not in heaven yet. And I still am in the flesh and still struggle with sin. So it's that dual reality. What is true from God's perspective and the life I live now in faith that makes that possible. What was that what you just said right now? In Latin or Greek? It's Latin. Simul ustus. I'm at once in the same time a saint and a sinner. Et peccator. Et peccator. Simul ustus et peccator. I'm at the same time a saint and a sinner. Exactly the same old thing. Yeah, I looked that up. Yeah. I like that. But that's, that's, the, that's the reality of what the cross has done for us. And the unbeliever, God's looking at them not through rose-colored glasses. He sees them in their sin. And they stand under the wrath of God, which is what Paul's talking about in this text. They stand under the wrath of God with his judgment impending. What was on passage? He's patient. He waits. He doesn't give them what they deserve because of grace. He's giving them time to hear and time to repent. So uh, people get all caught up on revelation and what it means. Um, you know, there are so many different views of revelation and people get all confused. But when Jesus ascended to heaven and sat down up on his throne, is he reigning or is he waiting to reign? He's reigning. He's reigning. What's he reigning over? Those that have gone before us. No. He's reigning over all creation as God, who's victorious. And he's, and he's reigning over the church, his people, enabling us to be those who proclaim the gospel in the world. It's a, it's a, it's a kingdom of grace right now. It's a time of grace. He's, he's giving the world time to repent. When he comes back, time of grace is over. He comes back as judge. The thousand-year reign of Christ, I see it differently. That it is the amount of time that God has given that he's going to reign on his throne from the time he ascended and sat down to the time he gets up and comes back. This time of grace. Where the kingdom of God is manifested in the world, which is us, the church, until judgment day comes, when he comes back. Yes? So, our judgment day, We're not going to. There, there won't be any judgment upon us if we die to go ahead and go to that judgment day. Well, Paul is actually going to get to that. have judgment because Jesus has stepped in front of you and absorbed yeah. all of our sin. Right. So, so we, 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 we show up, we're not going to be, you know, the old scenario of St. Peter's going to say, okay, now, you need to come over here, we need to talk about this. Yeah, no, not that, that. not that. It's, it, you're not going to have that. You're, you're going to go there, and you're going to be judged a believer, or you're going to be judged. Exactly. And Paul's going to, and Paul's going to get to that, because. And that's, that's judgment day. Right. Not, you, not, you're you have, you're going to have, individuals you're going to have two judgment days. Okay, Bar unless Christ comes back before you die, uh, you're going to have two judgment days. Yeah, Bobby, if you want to give me some more. Thank you. Uh, when you die, and we're actually going to talk about this a little bit today, when a person dies, their spirit leaves their body, goes to heaven, stands before God, and he makes a judgment. 
You already know what that judgment is. Paul's going to talk about it later in the book of Romans. You are declared not guilty. Why? Because you have faith in Jesus. He's your Savior. Your sins are taken away. You're declared not guilty, and your spirit goes to heaven. If you're an unbeliever, your spirit is cast away. Okay? To, to suffer like the rich man and Lazarus. Do, do you think that spirit goes in front of God? Hmm? God passes. Yes. He, he, he still, the spirit still goes in face yes. of God. Yes. Because you, God is going to pass judgment. It's like being put on trial, uh, you know, and the jury comes back and the judge reads the verdict, not guilty. God's already got the verdict because of faith. You're to declared to be not guilty. If you have no faith, God declares the verdict guilty, and your and your sin is evident. See, you're not playing games anymore once you die. You know the reality. I'm guilty. And, and you stand with God, and you know his judgment is just. You may not like it, but you know it's just. So the, the, the one with faith goes to heaven, with, with unbelief goes to hell. But when Christ comes back, what did Thessalonians say? Those who are alive who are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's us. Uh, and what was the first part of that passage in Thessalonians? Ooh. Let me find it real quick. Colossians. Thessalonians. Oh, I hope I get to Thessalonians, not Timothy. Pages are so thin. We want you, we don't, we don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as those who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died... Uh, and rose from the dead, so also God bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. Um, we say this by the, to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of command the, and the, uh, the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds meet the Lord in the air, and thus we'll always be with the Lord. Um, so when Christ comes back on Judgment Day, he brings back the spirits of all those who've died in the faith, who've fallen asleep. Their bodies are resurrected. Spirits are put back with them. When we come back down out of heaven, you our body. Yes, you get your body back, the very same body you got right now, because God created that body and he loves that body too. Uh, and you're resurrected, leaving behind all the consequences of sin, you died of heart disease, you died of cancer, whatever. That stays in the grave. Your body comes out perfect and holy. And you stand before God. And that's the, the uh, Matthew 24. Separation of sheep and the goats. Oh, everyone's resurrected. Everyone lives forever. Everyone gets eternal life. Everyone. It's a matter of the address. Those who go to heaven, are, it's called eternal life. Those who go to hell, it's called eternal death. But you live forever. Your body, the unbeliever's spirits, hell's emptied on judgment day. All the spirits, all the spirits are reunited with everybody, and the spirits of heaven are reunited with bodies. Everyone's resurrected. Everyone stands for Jesus, and He separates the sheep and the goats. That's a that's people. I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. Your life testified to your faith. Welcome, good, well done. The unbelievers are, you know, there's no justification. You can't say, I object to your, your determination. No, I was hungry. You didn't feed me. I searched. You didn't give me a drink. Your life testifies to the fact you had no faith. Depart from me. You are cursed of my father. And they go body and spirit back to hell, just as the believers go body and spirit back to heaven. Back to heaven. The spirit was in heaven, comes back, goes back. For, for those, what Paul says, if we're alive when that happens, we just go to heaven. Our bodies are transformed and we go to heaven. If we die, our spirit comes back with Jesus, reunite with the body, and goes back goes back to heaven. Okay, uh, everybody's going to live forever. Now, extrapolate that out. This is my imagination. I'm not going to point to the Bible passage and say, "Thus says the Lord," because I can't. But if the believer is resurrected, righteous and holy, which means everything that is a consequence of sin is left in the grave, he goes to heaven, and you are in absolute wonder and bliss. Great. The unbeliever doesn't have that. Everything that was a consequence of sin is still there. What caused you to die? Pancreatic cancer was one of the most painful things okay, in the world. There's nothing that says that what was of sin is taken away when this unbeliever comes out of the grave. 
So you're going to have the fire and judgment of God and the pain of pancreatic cancer for eternity. That's just horrible. Because what was of sin is still there. It wasn't taken away in the resurrection because the righteous are resurrected holy. The unrighteous are resurrected unrighteous and are separated and cast away. That's the, one of the most wondrous passages in Revelation. Death is thrown into the lake of fire. Death ceases to exist. No one is dead. Everyone lives forever. So when I appear before God, I'm not going to have this body? You'll have that body perfect. So, so when you go to heaven, but no at first you're not going to have a body. Well, if, if you die, yeah, your spirit, away, your spirit, my spirit goes... goes He's just going to put me to sleep. I can't be an angel or something. No, you know, you become an angel. You're better than an angel. You're better than an angel. You're going to command. Your spirit goes to be with Jesus in heaven. Remember, remember, we're, we're, we get confused and think soul and spirit are the same thing. They're not. Spirit is that part of us that God created the moment we were conceived. And, and Solomon talks about that when we die, the, our spirit returns to God who gave it. So when you were conceived in your mother's womb, you got your DNA from mom and daddy and your spirit from God. And when you die, your spirit leaves your physical body and goes back to God because he created it to live in relationship with him. And then when Jesus comes back in judgment day, your spirit comes back and is reunited with your body. And it is, is holy and you get to live as God originally, like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, created perfect and holy in every way to live in relationship with God. Right. The unbeliever, same thing, just opposite, lives forever because, because death ceases to exist. The ultimate consequence of sin, in the day you eat of it, you will die. Why is the Messiah coming? To undo what sin did. To make possible a restored relationship with God? Yes. And also, to undo death itself. Everyone is going to live forever. Where's your soul? Soul is, we, we've confused the terms. Most people hear the word soul and they think in their, in their mind they're thinking what the spirit is. Yeah, soul is when your body is has your spirit in it and you're alive. I know you two ways. I know you by your physical appearance and I know you by your soul. Your mind, your will, your emotions, your personality, your likes, your dislikes, that's soul stuff. That's the soul stuff. And your right. spirit, the spirit is that part that is my connection. Yes. Connection to God through the Holy Spirit right now. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the word for psychology, where we deal with mind, will, emotions, desire, stuff like that, comes from the Greek psuche, first three letters, P S Y, just like in psychology. Uh, that's that's Psychologists deal with your emotions. That's soul stuff. Yeah. Not spirit stuff. Not spirit. Okay. Yeah, that's just they say spirit they see. That's just they they say spirit right? It's soulmate. Soulmate. Yeah. Do what, Bobby? That's just a lot of stuff. Well, well, it is. It is. The more, the more you understand it, the more you, and the more you learn from it, and you understand it, and then you start visualizing what you're reading, and it's like. Well, he knew all of this before anything? Yeah. And, and, and to think that when that time comes and, G, and Jesus comes back, what God has in store for you. Yes, you'll have your body, but you won't have diabetes. You won't have any, any physical ailments. You, you won't be overweight. You won't. You always talk about how, how you know, much you've gained and lost and stuff. Your body is going to be perfect. Which means that when you eat, your body's going to perfectly use and digest everything you eat. Because you get to eat in heaven too. Oh, you get to eat too? Yeah. Whoa. You're going to the marriage feast of the Lamb. The tree of life is going to there and its leaves are the healing of the nations and the fruit you get to pluck and eat. I mean, there is physical eating pictured in eternity. Okay? I know. And this is coming out on YouTube? This lesson, yeah, will be on YouTube. Okay, well, we gotta, we got to stop because it's time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning, for the good discussion, the opportunity to, to delve deeper and to understand, yes, your wrath, but also your mercy and the grace that you've extended to us in Jesus that we have the confidence and the assurance of knowing that we belong to you 
and that through Jesus we are declared holy and one day we will fully be holy in your presence. We thank you for those promises that we live with and the assurance they give us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. I will see you all next door. Yes, sir. Thanks, Rick.